Hi folks, we're just giving a few seconds here uh, for Zoom to let everybody in. If you are already in tonight's webinar with us, uh, you can open up your chat window and find some information about how to buy tonight's feature book. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and we are thrilled to host tonight's event with Janice Nimura presenting her new book, The Doctor's Blackwell, How Two Pioneering Sisters Brought Medicine to Women and Women to Medicine. She'll be talking with Emily Silverman, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Janice, Emily, and the team at WW Norton for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make this space for conversation and connection. Now we have just a couple of housekeeping things for you. Uh, first, in our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of your fellow attendees on the top of your Zoom screen. There are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with your fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Doctor's Blackwell, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, noon to 7 p.m. every day of the week. And you can purchase Janice's book and many others on site. Or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. You can find that by link in the chat. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, Buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Now to introduce tonight's speakers. Our interviewer tonight is Emily Silverman. She's an internist at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, assistant professor of medicine at UCSF and creator host of The Nocturnists, a medical storytelling live show and podcast where healthcare workers share stories of joy, sorrow, and self-discovery. Her writing has been published in the New York Times, the Virginia Quarterly Review, McSweeney's, and others. She's currently working, working on a book with the support of a 2018 fellowship from McDowell. She lives in San Francisco with her husband, some musical instruments, and many plants. She'll be speaking with our featured author, Janice Nira. She is an independent historian whose last book, Daughters of the Samurai, A Journey from East to West and Back, was a New York Times notable book of 2015. She's the winner of a 2017 National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Award, and she lives in New York City. Her new book, The Doctor's Blackwell, is a powerful work of feminist, medical, and US history. 
This captivating biography looks closely at the sisters Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell, English immigrants who became the first and third women respectively in the US to earn medical degrees, and who in 1857 founded the very first hospital staffed by women, the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children. Janice is going to start us off with a presentation on the book, and then she'll be talking with Emily and with all of you. Janice, please take it away. All right, thank you, Chelsea, and thank you, Greenlight, for giving us this form tonight. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you tonight, Emily. Emily's podcast is a must listen if you have any interest in the medical humanities. Um, so tell them I sent you. Um, so I just wanted to do a lightning um, trip through the Blackwell story so that you have some words and pictures to in your minds when Emily and I, Emily and I start discussing it. Um, so you may be familiar with the, um, Oops, hello, let's get the, this going. There we go. You may be familiar with the name Elizabeth Blackwell, uh, usually followed by the phrase first woman doctor. Um, she was the first woman to receive a medical degree in this country in 1849. Her sister Emily on the right uh, followed her five years younger to become the third woman in 1854. And as you heard, they founded an infirmary in New York and a women's medical college. So I encountered the Blackwell story for the first time five years ago. Uh, this despite the fact that I had grown up in New York where they practiced, gone to a proudly feminist girls school, was the math science kid, uh, graduated intending to be pre-med, I swerved. Um, I'd never heard of them and I was astonished uh, when I first ran into them. So I started to investigate and I realized that they were fairly easy to find on the children's biography shelf. Uh, a book like this from the 40s, um, a middle grade version, this is in my daughter's school library, um, a children's version. They all had similarities. They were all featuring perky, pretty girls and young women with stethoscopes um, and lots of moxie. Um, and it was always just Elizabeth and never Emily. But the Blackwells looked like this um, and they were never photographed holding stethoscopes. And even if they had in the 1840s and 50s when they were as young as the women in those books, um, they would have been holding a stethoscope that looked like this. <laughs> so I really wanted to reintroduce the Blackwells um, because it was clear that it was, it was, the time was ripe. Uh, the children's versions were sanitized. And as I investigated further, it became clear that these were two very complicated women. And I wanted to reintroduce them to the present in all their complexity um, and their whole story, not just what fits on a plaque or in a children's book. Okay, so what is that story? Uh, the Blackwells were born in Bristol, England. Nine, eight out of the nine children were born in England. Um, and they were the daughters of a paradox, a man who was both a sugar refiner and an abolitionist. Think about that for a sec. Um, his fortune was based on enslaved labor that he abhorred. Um, he was a dissenter from the Church of England. He believed in education. He gave all of his children an equal education, regardless of their sex. Um, and then in search of his dream of being able to do sugar without cruelty, he moved them out to America and all the way out to the frontier town of Cincinnati uh, in search of his grail, which was to make beets, uh, sugar out of beets uh, and without slavery. Um, he got all the way out to Cincinnati and then he dropped dead, uh, leaving them $20 and um, no obvious future. So his final lesson was that a husband is no guarantee of success and none of his daughters ever married. Elizabeth on the left there was born in 1821. She was voraciously brilliant, um, socially quite awkward, blessed with a healthy sense of self-worth. She admired the 19th century transcendentalist writer and editor Margaret Fuller, um, who had at the time just then written a bestseller called Woman in the 19th Century. Uh, and she was someone who believed that humanity could not rise to a new level of enlightenment until women asserted their own powers and proved that they could do anything by virtue of talent and toil, nothing to do with sex. Uh, they could be sea captains if they wanted to. And Elizabeth was captivated by this idea 
and decided that she wanted to be one of those people, one of those women who proved Margaret Fuller's point and could lead humanity toward a brighter future. And so she chose medicine, not because she loved science or because she wanted to heal people. She didn't really like people. She thought sickness was equal to weakness. Bodily functions were disgusting. Um, she chose medicine because at the moment that she chose it, it was an unusually clear way to prove her point. Medicine in this mid 19th century moment was redefining itself, both scientifically and institutionally. Um, hitherto, it had been more of a trade, midwives, barber surgeons, maybe a village doctor who had learned to be a doctor by apprenticing to a village doctor. Um, increasingly though, it was a profession, a profession of men, who proved their credentials by going to a medical school, and there were increasingly more of those, and getting a diploma. And so Elizabeth thought to herself, if a woman could get herself to a medical school and pass all of the tests required for a medical diploma, who could say that she wasn't qualified to be a doctor? And at this point, those tests weren't particularly rigorous. As this cartoon suggests, medical school uh, consisted of some lectures, maybe a little dissection that you could watch if you were lucky, uh, and many medical, uh, many MDs graduated with frightening levels of ignorance, probably having never encountered a living patient. Um, so at the age of 26, Elizabeth won admission to a tiny rural medical school in Geneva, New York, uh, in the Finger Lakes region. On the left there is the original medical department building. It's not there anymore. On the right is where it used to be uh, on, the, on the modern campus of Hobart and William Smith Colleges. She graduated at the top of her class in 1849. She was admitted there largely by accident. That's a good story, which you um, maybe we'll get to later, or you'll admit, maybe just have to read about it in the book. Um, she had no practical training, as I mentioned, so off she went to Paris to a maternity hospital called La Maternité that's housed in this, this old convent, which still stands. That's a picture that we took. Um, and it was a place for training midwives. And as a public hospital, it was a place that served poor women, um, large, uh, often prostitutes, women who had no other place to go to deliver a child. And there, Elizabeth began to sort of make the turn toward an idea that, uh, the idea of public health, which was also just emerging at this time. And she began to make the connection between poverty and disease. Um, she also had a catastrophic uh, illness that changed the, the shape of her career, if not the direction of it. Um, she was delivering, she was working with the baby of a woman who had been infected with gonorrhea. A baby that passes through the birth canal of an infected woman can often end up with an eye infection, gonorrheal conjunctivitis. Elizabeth was cleaning such a baby's eye when some of the water splashed into her face and she contracted gonorrheal conjunctivitis, which resulted in her losing one eye. Um, if you squint hard at this portrait, you can see the asymmetry in her gaze. She wore a glass eye for the rest of her life. Um, but this meant also that it, it, it pushed her a little bit more toward public health because she could no longer be a surgeon. She was, even reading was a little bit hard for her. Uh, but she did not run home to recuperate. She continued on from Paris to London, uh, continued her training at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, uh, met Florence Nightingale, and had a, a, a very robust communion with this other woman who was passionate about the role that women might be able to play in health and hygiene, although they would never quite agree during their long relationship. Um, and then she came back to, Elizabeth came back to New York where she assumed she would hang out a shingle and see patients. But in New York, as in most of America in the 1850s, um, the idea of a woman physician was impossible and no self-respecting woman who had the money in, to choose her own health care would choose to see a female physician. The very phrase female physician connoted someone like Madame Restel, the notorious Fifth Avenue abortionist, someone who operated on the wrong side of the law. This is a cartoon from the National Police Gazette. You can see she's portrayed as akin to a demon eating a baby. Um, this was not what Elizabeth wanted to project, but it's what the term that she had chosen to be connoted at this time. Not easy to get past that. So she's sort of stranded in New York with waiting for patients who don't come. And meanwhile, she turns to her sister, Emily, who she has sort of anointed to follow her on her path toward medicine. She knows, Elizabeth knows that this is going to be a lonely path. Um, she 
esteems her own family higher than anyone else in the world. And she knows she wants some company. So she looks at her four sisters and picks the smartest one, Emily, the most intellectually talented and said, Emily, I anoint you to, to follow in my footsteps. And Emily looks around at her prospects and says, okay, I can, I can do that. She actually has more trouble getting into medical school than Elizabeth did because in the wake of Elizabeth's success in medical school, the, the medical schools, including Geneva Medical College, close their doors even more firmly against women. Uh, she struggles and struggles and eventually receives a medical degree from Cleveland Medical College, which is now Case Western. And then she goes off to Edinburgh to continue her medical training um, with the illustrious James Young Simpson, one of the most prominent physicians in Britain at that time. She really distinguishes herself as one of his assistants, which is extraordinary. Um, uh, but even that success still doesn't protect her from the kind of snark that both Blackwell sisters have come into. This is um, a cartoon from the London satiric newspaper Punch, round about the time that Emily was working for James Young Simpson, showing Emily uh, dressed in a bloomer costume, the scandalous costume of the feminists, um, looking rather mannish in a ridiculous hat and squinting through her spectacles at the only patient who has come to visit her, a lapdog clasped in the arms of a very beautiful feminine wasp-waisted young maiden. Um, so yeah, that's sort of where the world thought of them. Uh, then Emily comes back to New York uh, to join Elizabeth at last and together they found the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children and its first home is in a building that still stands on the corner of Crosby and Bleecker at the edge of Greenwich Village. Um, it was the first hospital staffed entirely by women. And it wasn't just a place to give poor women a place to consult doctors of their own sex. It was also a place to welcome the slowly growing numbers of med female medical graduates to give them a place to receive the practical training that they so desperately needed. Um, there, Elizabeth and Emily had always scorned this, the, 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 the growing numbers of female medical colleges that were starting to open as being medi mediocre and inferior. But in the end, and after the Civil War, they ended up opening their own uh, women's medical college, um, specifically because uh, they wanted to give women the opportunity to have as a medical education that was as rigorous as possible. And in fact, their college was more rigorous than the colleges they had themselves attended. So that was just their professional lives. Personally, there's just as much stuff. Um, both sisters adopted daughters, which is interesting stories in themselves. Um, Emily spent the last several decades of her life living with a female partner, another surgeon named Elizabeth Cushier. Um, two of Emily and Elizabeth's brothers, Henry and Sam, married two of the most prominent feminists of the day, Lucy Stone and Antoinette Brown. Um, but despite these women now being their sisters-in-law, Emily and Elizabeth really didn't agree with what the emerging women's movement wanted, which was the vote. They didn't believe women should have the vote because how silly to give a woman the vote before she was an independent-minded person. Otherwise, she would just vote the way her men voted. Um, in fact, Elizabeth and Emily had a pretty dim view of women at every level, and that sort of shadow misogyny behind their uh, feminism is another really interesting and complicated aspect of this story. Um, once they had founded their institutions, they parted ways because they had always had sort of a disagreement about what a woman doctor should be. Elizabeth more of, thought a woman doctor should be more of a teacher armed with science, um, more oriented toward public health probably because she herself preferred that direction. Emily wanted to be a surgeon, a practitioner, a medical professor, as skilled as any man. Uh, and so in about 1870, as soon as the medical college had been founded, Elizabeth moved back to England where she had always preferred to be and spent the last 40 years of her life there. Emily stayed in New York and ran the institutions that they had founded together. Um, and just in closing, um, the Blackwells, you know, were not, as, as I discovered, the Blackwells were not anything like those perky, pretty young women and girls on those, on the covers of those picture books. Um, they were complicated, prickly, imperfect, very real heroines, and the kind of women who change the world and who we all need to learn how to embrace. So, 
that's where we are with the Blackwell story. Um, I thought maybe I would just read a mini passage here to give you a sense of what the book sounds and feels like. This is a scene from the middle of the book where Elizabeth has returned to New York and is waiting sort of lonely for Emily to finish her degree. Um, and she's waiting for patients who mostly don't come, but she's starting to have a few. Um, Though her practice still did not cover expenses, Elizabeth was beginning to see a trickle of private patients. It was clear to these women what Elizabeth had to offer, an authoritative intelligence, a good understanding of basic medicine, and best of all, the opportunity to confide the unspeakable details of gynecological trouble to a woman professionally qualified to help them. Their appreciation of her was evident and for Elizabeth, sometimes embarrassing. By the by, she warned Emily, one great annoyance in my practice that I really don't know how to meet. Some of my patients will fall in love with me, do what I will. They absolutely haunt me, make the most enamored eyes, and three of them, in unguarded moments, kissed me. Even when she overcharged the, dem the demonstrative ones, they came back for more. These satisfied patients surely meant to convey nothing more than ardent gratitude, but Elizabeth had never liked to be touched and preferred to think of herself as above mawkish entanglements. Or perhaps it was a case of doth protest too much. I can assure you it's no small cross, she wrote. I've no objection to kissing a healthy, handsome man occasionally, but love passages with women are diabolical. If certain women were too enthusiastic, even the most open-minded men continued to feel a deep discomfort with a woman who attached MD to her name. As long as Elizabeth could practice alone, all was well, until she needed a second opinion. The first time she called in a male colleague for a consultation, unintentional comedy ensued. An elderly woman presented with severe pneumonia and Elizabeth asked an old acquaintance, a kindly physician who had once treated her father to confirm her diagnosis. After his examination, he paced up and down nervously. A most extraordinary case, he exclaimed. Such a one never happened to me before. I really do not know what to do. Elizabeth was baffled. Had she mistaken the symptoms of pneumonia? But the good doctor's agitation had nothing to do with the patient. He simply could not imagine a professional consultation with a female physician. The cognitive dissonance was too great. Elizabeth diplomatically suggested that perhaps he could think of it as a friendly talk rather than a clinical discussion. That did the trick. Useful advice was conveyed and the patient swiftly recovered. All right, so let's unshare the screen. And there. Hi, Emily. Hi, Janice. <laughs> Thanks for reading that. <laughs> I really enjoyed the presentation and the photos. It um, brought some more uh, dimensionality into the story that I really loved. So thanks. Thank you. So um, this is an amazing book. And I think um, the part of your presentation that stood out to me the most was the children's books. Hmm. I just, I hadn't realized uh, that this story was told in that way and to that audience. And speaking for myself, as a woman physician, I actually didn't know the story of Elizabeth Blackwell or Emily Blackwell um, in adult books or children's books. And I love this impulse to reintroduce them into the world and to in all of their complexity and things like that. And I was wondering where did the real story live? Um, were all of their diaries and letters in like one library and you just like set up shop there and looked through it? Or did you have to travel across the country to get these different pieces? Or how did you end up putting this story together? The, the vast bulk of it was in two places, thankfully. Uh, one, the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe for women's history and the other Library of Congress. Um, there were two huge dumps of material in those two places and, and, and just getting my head around those two was the bulk of it. And then there was there was stuff in a lot of different places, um, stuff in private collections, um, stuff at, there was some stuff at Columbia, there was some there was stuff in different universities, little bits and pieces. Um, and that you, and depending on which rabbit holes you went down, you would find different, you, you, you needed different stuff. Um, I also love walking in the footsteps of my subjects as much as I can. So if uh, Emily was in Edinburgh, I wanted to go to Edinburgh. I went to Bristol, I went to Paris, I went to London, I went to Geneva, New York, not Switzerland, um, and just tried to 
stand in 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 their in in the places that they gazed upon and feel what it felt like because i when i read i i'm i'm happiest when i'm reading with all five senses and you can do you can't really do that if all you're working with is paper um but you know the the, the funny thing for me was that i first encountered the black I, i'm strange in that i didn't first encounter the blackwells on the children's shelf Almost everybody I asked about them when I was first encountering them said, oh yeah, 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 I know who they are. I had a book about them when I was six. Um, I didn't have that book. And my first encounter with them was actually via Emily because I was in the Sophia Smith collection at Smith College, another women's history collection. And I was browsing in a book about queer contributions to the women's movement in the 19th century. And Emily popped up as having a female partner. And I was like, oh, who's this Emily Blackwell? I've never heard of her. And you can't really encounter Emily without very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so there it was. And, and then I thought, okay, um, this is a serious story that I've never heard of. I can't believe I've never heard of it. And let's go. So. And we hear a lot about Elizabeth and Emily, but it was a big family. There was Anna, there were the brothers in the family. Tell us a little bit about the Blackwell clan because mm -hmm. I'm an only child. So as I was reading about <laughs> So as I was reading about this big family, I was like, "Oh my god, like all of the different connections and relationships. Like what was it like to unearth all of that?" I definitely was like the outsider journalist anthropologist figuring out what it felt like to have siblings. Yeah, they were a crowd. And, and since they had always sort of been outsiders and then they were uprooted so many times, um, their outsiderness made them turn toward each other even more intensely. So there was Anna, the hypochondriac drama queen journalist. And there was Ellen, the youngest sister who studied painting with Ruskin. And, um, you know, in, in, in Europe, there was uh, Henry who married Lucy Stone and, and, and agreed to, you know, public publicly proclaim his own feminism. He was like the first feminist husband. Amazing. Um, there was Sam who married Antoinette Blackwell, who was the first ordained female minister in this country. Um, and the cool thing was that they were intensely bonded to each other and they all drove each other a little nuts. So they were constantly leaving each other and writing copiously back to each other, which meant that I didn't just get um, one person's perspective. I got the, all of their perspectives on each other. So I, you know, you know, I got them, you know, being snarky about two of them being snarky about a third one, or five of them reacting to the same event. Um, and there was a lot of kind of interweaving. You know, there are all these thousands and thousands of letters, and I did a lot of kind of um, lining them all up so that I could read them chronologically across voices and see the progression of the events through the. It was like. I'm not going to say it right, but like polyphony, um, you know, it was like it was like music from from many different points. Yeah, such a remarkable family, um, and Emily, as you said, really uh, followed the footsteps of Elizabeth. But Elizabeth blazed the trail. So tell us a little bit about Elizabeth's decision to pursue a career in medicine as the first woman to ever do that. Right, it wasn't an obvious choice. I mean, she wasn't somebody who really liked taking care of people, <laughs> which is wild. Um, I, I think there's a, there are several origin stories. There's, you know, there's, um, she, she was at her own dying father's bedside and, and, and at a moment when she happened to be the oldest child at home. And so there was a, a moment where she was sort of in charge in a medical context that I think made her feel empowered. So that was maybe a germ of it. The, the, the sort of mythological origin story is that she had a, a woman friend who was dying of some unmentionable disease um, who confided to her that her pain would have been lessened if she had been able to tell a woman doctor what hurt rather than being too embarrassed to tell a man. Um, that was a little too pat, I think. Um, but I really do think that this idea that you could go to a place and pass examinations and get a piece of paper that said doctor on it felt very straightforward. Nobody could argue with that. If you got all the answers right on the test and had the piece of paper, then you were a doctor uh, and no one could argue. So I, um, I think in the end, she had a very healthy ego. And I think she really mm -hmm. thought of herself as someone who could be important. Um, and this was a way to, to do that. It, 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 it impressed everyone she encountered, even if it was unfavorably, it, they still, everybody reacted to it. 
Talk a little bit about the obstacles that she faced getting into medical school and then once she got there, how did the men react to her? Yeah, well, that was so that was the story I alluded to. She, her admission was sort of a joke. Um, she had been rejected and rejected and rejected. Geneva Medical College was a tiny, remote, provincial place, a um, lot more energy than polish. Um, and, 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 you know, and medicine was what you studied if you weren't smart enough to go into the law. So, the, the, you know, it wasn't like today where only the best and the brightest pursue medicine, uh, not at all. Uh, it didn't require much except the money to pay the fees. And so she had been studying privately with a, a doctor of some standing in Philadelphia who had um, added his endorsement to her application letter when she wrote to Geneva College. And the faculty of Geneva College wasn't quite brave enough to just dismiss this man's endorsement. Um, and so they hit upon what they thought was a bright idea of punting the question to the student body and say, students, here's this bizarre request from this young woman in Philadelphia. Um, surely you'll reject it. And if any one of you is against her coming to study, we'll take care of that. It'll be it's your decision though. And the students kind of looked at each other and said, whoa, are, not only are our professors cowards, but this is going to be hella fun. <laughs> we're going to make some <laughs> mischief here. Um, they assumed that they were having a prank played on them by a neighboring medical school arrival. They assumed it was all, uh, all from the beginning a prank. So they had a meeting that night and basically beat into submission anybody who raised an objection until they had an anonymous response to the faculty, which was, yes, bring her. And then they forgot about it. They, they, it was just funny. And then three weeks later, a young woman walked into the lecture hall. So, you know, um, it, it's interesting because in her memoir, in the in the sort of forward part, forward facing part of her memoir, Elizabeth tells the story of her admission the way you would in a memoir. Um, one day an acceptance letter arrived and the next day I left for college. Um, in the appendix to that memoir though, she includes the eyewitness account of one of her classmates about beating everybody into submission until they said, yeah, the lady can come. Um, so she was aware that there was some, um, you know, accident to her path, but she wasn't going to put it up front. Um, once she was there, uh, she very quickly impressed the heck out of everybody because she was working harder and better than most of them. I think the students really quickly came to see her as an older sister. Um, quite literally, she was older than they were and, and she was better than they were. So, you know, she was nice to have around. The townspeople um, thought she was a freak. And so she didn't spend a whole lot of time communing with Geneva. Uh, she stayed pretty close to the, to the medical building. And you talked about how the stereotype of a woman physician might be, um, you know, a woman in sepia tones leaning over, you know, tending and nurturing to the ailing patient. But how Elizabeth actually wasn't like that at all. She was actually quite prickly and quite awkward. And so talk a little bit about how um, as a feminist icon, she defies stereotypes. Well, yeah, she was a misogynist at some level. And, <laughs> and, and I think that's fascinating because I think, I think um, a lot of us who declare ourselves feminists also wrestle with misogyny that we don't identify. It's kind of like our implicit bias in some ways. Um, you know, Elizabeth and Emily were hell bent on medical degrees that men didn't want to give them. They were doing everything backwards and in heels. Um, and <laughs> they did not want any other woman, even a woman, even other women who were also interested in medicine to taint their achievement. So, you know, I, I, I always say, so Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell were the first and third women doctors, which begs the question, who was the second one? And um, the second one was a woman named Nancy Talbot Clark, who actually took her degree from, from Cleveland Medical College just before Emily did. Um, Elizabeth and Emily always referred to her as little Mrs. Clark, and not in a nice way. And, um, and dismissed her and, and tried to kind of maneuver away from her so that no one would confuse her with them. Um, I found that both disappointing, a little off-putting and incredibly human because I, I defy you to find somebody who hasn't at some level, some time in their lives had that instinct, even if they maybe didn't act on it. Um, it, it, it is a hard truth of 
female achievement in our age is that that's still happening. Um, so I, that to me made this story so modern. Yeah. Um, she would, they would recognize a lot of, especially what women in the medical field still go through, um, trying to either be one of the boys or, or something different. Yeah, it was like almost this guardedness, like they, you know, were very skeptical of any other woman who might come up and, and challenge them. Um, and talk about Emily, because she, her personality was a little different. She, again, she wasn't um, fitting into the stereotypes either, but she had a different flavor. What was her story? Yeah, I think it, it's funny. I, she, it wasn't her idea to go into medicine, but once she was there, she liked it a lot more than Elizabeth did. I think she she really liked the science of it. She liked the the um, the the equipment. She liked the instruments. She liked the techniques. She liked trying to think of a better way of doing a uh, surgery or a better way of using a certain instrument. Um, she thought about what it meant to be a woman and whether there were things that could be done to make a woman's life healthier and better. Um, um, and she was also just better at connecting to other humans. Uh, you can see it more <laughs> clearly in the way that each of them adopted a daughter. As I said, um, the, the, the two, the, as, as mothers, they were very different. Elizabeth adopted a, a sort of a six-year-old, I think, um, uh, in 1854 when she at a point where she was very lonely and she marched up to the nurseries at Randall's Island and picked out an Irish orphan and brought her home and she became something between a servant and a daughter and a fan. She sort of needed someone to keep her company and love her. Um, and she needed that someone to just do that and nothing else. So Kitty, this little girl, grew up grew up to be sort of Elizabeth's acolyte, and she was never she was never um, given permission really to marry or have a career. Interestingly, she just <laughs> remained at Elizabeth's side, taking care of her and making her feel that she wasn't alone. Emily, on the other hand, adopted an infant, uh, named her after her her late mother and raised her to call her mama and sign her letters with kisses and um, nanny that they called her grew up to marry and give Emily four grandchildren. So it was a very different um, way of connecting. Emily also had a partner, you know, a, a, a Elizabeth Cushier, who, you know, everybody acknowledged um, they had a, a, a wonderful warmth together. Um, that was something Elizabeth never really achieved uh, at anything other than an intellectual level. She had intellectual communions with people like Florence Nightingale or with Lady Byron, the widow of the poet. And they had wonderful correspondence, but they were mostly written. Um, this wasn't about um, uh, intimate emotional connection. You mentioned Florence Nightingale and she was also in the slideshow presentation. Tell us a little bit about Elizabeth and Florence because we have sort of this towering medical figure and then this towering nursing figure. Um, how were they thinking about like doctors and nurses at the time and the role of each of those professions and the role of women in each of those professions? Yeah, it, it, it was kind of fascinating. I mean, frankly, the, the whole sepia toned, you know, woman leaning over the patient really connected more to the Florence Nightingale mystique, the lady with the lamp in the Crimean War, and, you know, helping the soldiers. Florence Nightingale and Elizabeth met at a moment where Florence Nightingale was not yet Florence Nightingale. She was um, the daughter of an upper middle class family that was expecting her to marry. She was chafing and stifled and desperate to go out and pursue her passion, which was nursing and public health. Uh, and then, you know, in, this is 1851, like a comet into her life streaks Elizabeth Blackwell, this American woman who has freed herself of her family, gotten a medical degree, is in Europe training to you know, getting her practical training, totally independent. Um, to Florence, it, it, it's like, you know, this is, this is like her dream. Who, who is this woman? And there's, and there's this amazing communion between them where Elizabeth visits her and then Florence invites her to her family's home and they have this sort of passionate meeting of the minds to a point. <laughs> and, then, and then it becomes clear that what Florence wants to do is 
bring women into nursing. And what Elizabeth wants to do is bring women into medicine and never the twain shall meet. And they, and they, they were intertwined throughout their lives in and out of each other's lives. And they never quite um, saw eye to eye on this. Yet Florence Nightingale was globally famous and Elizabeth Blackwell always um, yearned toward that kind of stardom. Uh, it's no accident that when Elizabeth and Emily founded the New York Infirmary, they founded it on May 12th, which is Florence Nightingale's birthday. They, you know, they knew that her that her star value was potent. They they understood publicity to that level, um, but they never quite uh, achieved it. And even when she was, even when Elizabeth was tempted to work alongside Florence Nightingale when she returned to England, she knew that if she tried to, if she did that, eventually she would end up doing what Florence wanted, and that wasn't on. So um, they kept their distance in the end. It's an interesting. Uh, there, there's a novel there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's so interesting to think about them existing. Um, at the same time and, and Lady Byron and just situating in history. Um, there's also a scene in there where she encounters Lincoln. Mm -hmm. um, it's like Zelig, that movie where, you know, where Woody Allen keeps popping up and, and with all the celebrities of the world. <laughs> they're, they're like that. They have this ability to intersect with all of the notables of their moment. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, Elizabeth encountered Lincoln uh, during the Civil War. She went down to Washington and a friend introduced them and she just sort of was amazed at how ugly he was <laughs> and never really talked much about that in her memoir. It's funny, she didn't see that as, as relevant to her mission <laughs> somehow. And you mentioned the, the New York Infirmary and we saw the picture of the building that's still there standing if anybody ever wants to go visit. Can you go inside or is there a plaque or how is it There's set up? There's a plaque on the outside. Um, and uh, actually it's interesting, The 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 woman who is sort of the, the guiding spirit of that building, a uh, jewelry designer who actually designed this pendant, it's part of her Blackwell collection, um, lives and works in the building and, um, and her, her showroom is now in the bottom and she is passionate about the Blackwell story and really sees that the, the stewardship of that building as being kind of like a temple of, 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 women, of professional women, which I kind of love. I, I wrote the infirmary chapter of the book sitting at her kitchen table, which felt like mm. communing with the ghosts. I was felt so lucky to be able to do that. I love that temple to professional medical <laughs> women. And what might a day in the life of a women physician at that hospital have looked like back then? That's a good question. Um, a lot of a lot of different roles. You know, there was the there was a dispensary that was part of it, where women could, where women of the neighborhood would just show up and need something, a cold remedy or a, something for a, a, a an injury. Um, there were wards up above, a ward for laboring women and a ward for in, for ill for illness. Um, uh, there were, as I said, young female medical graduates who were doing their training there. Um, and then there were also some more experienced ones who became what were called sanitary visitors, who would leave the infirmary building and visit the infirmary's clientele in their homes, in the tenements, in the neighborhood, um, spreading ideas about good hygiene, uh, parenting skills, um, prevention. Um, that was sort of the public health mission of, of the infirmary. And in fact, uh, one of the most notable of the sanitary visitors that Elizabeth and Emily had was a woman named Rebecca Cole, who was one of the first black physician, female physicians in America. Seems like kind of an awesome hospital. Like, is there anything like that today? A hospital that's staffed and run by women for women about women's health? Like, does that even exist? It should, if it doesn't. I feel like it should. <laughs> Um, maybe we can look to that hospital as a model for some future public uh, health initiatives. <laughs> um, great. Well, we have one minute left before switching over to the Q&A. So I'm going to ask you a question that I've asked you once before. And um, you told me that you wanted some time to think about it. So I will ask again. Um, if we could sit down with Elizabeth and Emily and have some tea, um, probably not some wine or not some whiskey because that's not really how they rolled. <laughs> probably some herbal tea. Um, what would you ask them? What would you tell them? What would you want to talk to them about? I think 
first thing I would want to ask them, and I think we, we discussed this a little earlier, but, um, is was medicine a good choice to make the point that they wanted to make about what women could do? Did it did it work? Um, was it satisfying? Um, did they wish at any point that they had pursued another way to that goal? I would be curious to know. Um, you know, I, I I think that with Emily, it was genuinely passion that kept her in in doctoring. With with Elizabeth, you know, she she found her way toward being more of a public speaker. Um, and then the other thing I'd love to ask them about is what the heck would they do about our current mess in public health and, and how would they run the pandemic? You know, what would their mm. operation work look like? I bet it would be a lot faster than ours. I bet it would too. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna open the Q&A window now and we'll just go through some questions. Is that okay? Yes, let's do it. All right, um, somebody, Pamela Jarvis, would like to know what was their mother like? Oh, good question. Hannah, Hannah Blackwell, um, the matriarch, um, was kind of a pain. She, she, <laughs> she was not a career woman. She was much more concerned with the state of everyone's soul. Um, she was a very pious um, woman who liked to go to revival meetings and all of her letters are about our, our worries, our, our, our endless anxiety about whether or not her children are going to church wherever they are. Um, her letters, I, 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 would, I eventually came to kind of roll my eyes when I got to them because they were all endless and they were all amazingly repetitive and the same subject. Um, she was sort of the glue because they all, they all, you know, she was their only parent and they were very loyal to her, um, all the siblings, but, um, she was sort of the, 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 the family hearth, but she didn't really um, fuel any of their professional passions. She sort of watched in horror a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we have another question here from Victoria Tomlinson. What did the New York tabloids think of women doctors? Did they help the Blackwells attract patients and students or did they cause them trouble? Good question. Hi, Tori. Um, uh, Horace Greeley, who was the founding editor of the New York Tribune, uh, was a big Blackwell ally. And he was, he was not just, he was a supporter in many ways. He gave them good, good ink. Um, and he was very careful to help Elizabeth distinguish herself from the female physicians who were running ads in the classified section for mysterious pills that would solve all your problems. Um, uh, so, you know, when once he helped them with their credibility and the, the press for the most part was pretty respectful of, of what they were doing once they had founded institutions that were clearly being supported by wealthy donors. Um, there was a certain um, respectability that kicked in. Um, but at, at first, you know, uh, that was, that was the big problem is that when Elizabeth first returned to New York, she couldn't really advertise her services because the only people who advertised medical services were the kind of women doctors you didn't wanna see. Uh, and it was very hard to overcome that PR problem. Speaking of the stereotype of the woman physician as the abortionist, which you mentioned earlier, um, Pamela wants to know, did Elizabeth and Emily take any position on contraception, um, and maybe I will add abortion. Yeah, um, Elizabeth was more vocal about this than Emily. Um, Elizabeth was vocally anti-abortion. She thought it was um, a horror. Um, she, but she did believe that limiting family size was important for the health of everyone. Um, her <laughs> solution to how one was supposed to limit family size was that a woman should be able to tell her husband what time of the month to have sex and what time of the month not to. You know, um, and this is another a, a perfect example of the way Elizabeth was sort of too ideological to to really succeed the way she had hoped to, because her ideas about this were at this level of utopian perfection <laughs> that no ma married woman struggling not to have more children could really 
live up to. I mean, that, that just, this is, this is Elizabeth who had never had a partner and never born a child, um, making something up about what should be possible that in practical terms simply wasn't. Yeah, Elizabeth, Elizabeth and her relationship to sex and sexuality is a really fascinating strand of this book. It's my husband turning on the lights because it's getting dark. Um, <laughs> so uh, another reason to check out the book is, is that piece of it I just found really compelling. Um, a question from Shelley. Why did Elizabeth get all the fame in the children's books? Why do they leave out Emily? <laughs> because she wasn't first. That's the thing. You get, you get, if you if you win first prize, nobody knows who won second and third. Um, that it's a powerful thing, first woman doctor, and um, uh, and also Elizabeth left a lot more behind her than Emily did. That was part of the challenge of this book: is that I was determined to make this a story of both of them, and the material, the source material for Elizabeth is just much deeper. She wrote more, more was written about her. She published more. Emily was a more private person. And although she left some great stuff, there just wasn't nearly as much of it. Um, so, you know, if you if you read the book and you feel like, oh, I wanted more of Emily, well, just know that that was about as much of Emily as there was. Mm. Um, it's all there. <laughs> and since I'm not a novelist, I couldn't supply any more. <laughs> and you talk about how Elizabeth has the credit of establishing the hospital, but as soon as it was established, she split back to Europe and Emily ran it for 40 years. So not only does Emily get left out of the story, but she did a lot of the work. Well, that's it. I think she did it so well that she actually um, sustained her sister's legacy to the detriment of her own. Um, she, she kept her sister's name, her, Elizabeth Blackwell's name was on the institutions all the way through. Um, so they were always affiliated, associated in the, in the mind of the public with this name Elizabeth Blackwell, not Emily, even though Emily was the one who was running them. And this question is related to what we're talking about. It comes from Jacqueline Saylor. Did you come to like one sister more than the other? And even if not, did you find it harder to write about one than the other? Did you have a bias in favor of one? And how did that affect your author's flow? Ooh, good question, Jacqueline. Um, I, I'm tempted to say, read the book and tell me what team you thought I was on. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think if, if I were going to go and choose a doctor from between the two of them, I would choose Dr. Emily. Um, uh, as, a, as, as someone I wanted to have coffee with. Um, in terms of um, my, my respect and often awe for their achievements, it's very hard not to um, be blown away by what Elizabeth Blackwell did and what she overcame. I mean, this is a woman who lost an eye a year into her training. This was, you know, within the year of receiving her diploma, she lost an eye in the pursuit of the knowledge that she was trying to find. Um, the, the fact that, and, and she was thousands of miles from her family when this happened. And instead of running home to them, she ran in the other direction. She actually, at one point, once she had recovered enough to be able to use the good eye enough, she, she was desperate to find a way to restore her health. And by herself, she took off across Europe to go to a water cure spa in, in, in Silesia, which was sort of on the edge of Poland and then Czechoslovakia, um, to you know, a, a, a spa where she was going to you know, drink and bathe and sweat and try to restore her health. Um, she did this by herself, ill, almost blind. Um, I don't know anyone today who would, you know, get on a train and do this. She did it by stagecoach and on foot, you know. Um, there was a, a degree of formidableness to Elizabeth Blackwell that it's it's very hard not to be bowled over by. So even though she wasn't necessarily the one who I would choose to hang out with, um, as far as, 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 as getting to know her and really try to, to dig into what was motivating her, she was fascinating. They were equally fascinating, so. Yeah, I, I feel like it would be tempting to side with Emily because she's such a rock. Um, but I have to admit, I was so drawn to Elizabeth's fiery, like, like diary entries and all of the desire that she had. And just, I don't know, there was just so much energy there. So yeah, I mean, the, the, the one of the, the, the points where it's really easy to see the difference between them is Elizabeth would say things like doubt is disease. 
<laughs> and, and Emily would say things like, gosh, I just don't know if I have what it takes. Mm -hmm. And both of those are recognizable to me. Um, I, I think I'm more the latter, but but I think most of us are more the latter. But it takes some some people who say doubt is disease to make things change. Um, yes. You have to have that degree of ego and that degree of certainty. Um, otherwise, you 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 know you swerve. Yeah, yeah. She was so rooted in her in her mission. Uh, we have a few more minutes, so I have some more questions. Um, Sydney Stern would like to know. How did the Blackwells support themselves through medical school and through all the years of training until they had a practice? Good question. Um, the Blackwell family was this had this strange inversion, you know. So the the patriarch dies. Um, the children range in age from basically early twenties down to five years old, um, and the three eldest are women or they're are girls. So the, the three eldest immediately start teaching. Um, to earn money to support the family. Um, and their brothers who are in the middle of the range, as they finally grow up, start when they get old enough to have jobs, they, they take over the breadwinning aspect. But there's always this sort of gratitude that the, that, the, that the older sisters kind of rescued the family. And the brothers, as they came along behind them, in gratitude, I felt like, um, were willing to support this unusual tendency in all of their sisters to pursue careers. Um, and so Samuel and Henry, and then their younger brother, George, George Washington, who was the youngest who was named after they landed here. Um, he was very successful in real estate. Um, the brothers supported the sisters in their pursuits. And then eventually donors supported Elizabeth and Emily in their pursuits as well. Once they had opened institutions, they could attract um, money from, from wealthy patrons uh, in addition to from it within their own families. But money was a preoccupation always. I, you know, wading through these thousands of letters, you always had to get through the money and weather section before you got to the good stuff. Um, they were gonna talk about you know, the rain and then the lack of funds and then how they felt. <laughs> Speaking of money, Pamela wants to know who were their wealthy donors and were any of them women? Yeah, um, most of their donors were sort of progressives, Quakers, uh, Unitarians. Um, and sometimes in some cases, the donor might have been male, but the reason he was donating was that his wife was a passionately happy patient of one of the Blackwells. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you if you go through the roles of their donors, you, you see, um, you know, the Horace Greeley's, the Charles Dana's, the Sedgwick's, the you know, the the people who were um, at the at the leading edge of progressive thought, free thinking. And we have a couple of questions that are related. So um, Susanna Einstein would like to know if the Blackwells uh, were familiar with the Alcotts, uh, who are also well-known transcendentalists. And then similarly, Anne Byerly would like to know if they uh, were connected at all with the Peabody sisters. Yeah, so both the Alcotts and the Peabody's are sort of Boston area folk. Um, they would have had maybe uh, less than six degrees of separation with them. Um, but Elizabeth and Emily, at least, were much more New York centric. Um, they did hang out with um, the Channings. The, 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 those were some fairly intense Unitarian and transcendentalist thinkers. Um, and with the with uh, the Beechers, with Henry Ward Beecher and, and Harriet Beecher Stowe, their, their father Lyman Beecher had been out in Cincinnati. Um, the Alcott's and the Peabody's were more Boston and um, Elizabeth and Emily didn't really stray near that much. Their older sister, Anna, did spend a blink of time at, um, oh my goodness, I'm having a brain wrinkle, um, the commune, Brook Farm um, in Massachusetts, where, uh, where, where, which was the, the sort of epicenter of a lot of that thinking. And so she may have crossed paths with them and probably did, um, but that you have to draw a line somewhere when you're doing this kind of research. And as much as I really wanted to go with Anna to Brook Farm, I couldn't <laughs> in, in the arc of, of Elizabeth and Emily's story. All right, well, we have 
one or two minutes left and I um, will take one last question. This one is from Naomi Tarantal. In the course of your research, did you come across any other unknown or underknown figures about whom you'd like to write your next book? Oh God, I wish. <laughs> Um, if if I did, they haven't yet revealed themselves to me as being as being book subjects. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's it's every person every person who does this kind of work is their dream to have the next one in hand when they when they finally finish the one in, that they're working on. But that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> if anybody has any ideas, I'm all ears. <laughs> well, we will have to wait and see. I'm sure this is not the last we've heard of you. Um, but in the meantime, we uh, are so excited to celebrate the Doctors Blackwell and this incredible, incredible story and incredible book. And as a doctor, I'm just so grateful that you brought them to my attention. I am telling everybody about this, um, and I encourage everybody in the audience to to pick it up and, and read it. It's really just so well done, and it's funny, and it's um, like dense, but not in a bad way. It's just there's like so much primary source there, and the letters, and I don't know. It's just a real, real um, thrill to read. So. Thank you for writing it. And thanks for being here with me tonight. Thank you for living it, Emily. And mm. everybody needs to go and listen to The Nocturnists, which is basically like the mock story hour, but with healthcare people. And it is brilliant. So <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, Janice and Emily, for tonight's fantastic conversation. And thank you to everyone for sharing the space with us tonight. A uh, reminder that you can support Janice and Greenlight by buying the Doctor's Blackwell. You can find that book buy link in the chat window. And in case you missed any part of tonight's event or you just want to indulge in a rewatch, um, a reminder that it's been recorded. And you can uh, catch that on our YouTube channel, Greenlight Bookstore, uh, within the next couple of days. So keep an eye on our social channels for that recording. Uh, thank you again so much, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.